Hey, I'd like to speak with you about faith and works this morning. And I've gone through uh, the Bible and found areas speaking of faith and what it takes to have faith, even just to the point of knowing Christ or having Christ, to the point of having salvation. And then from that, I wanted to get into what with someone that has faith and does works and then comes by the wayside, those that have had faith and done things so grand and great for us through their works. And with this, I'd like to start in Matthew chapter 8, be verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And with this, at this time, the leper was set aside. It was an unclean person. It was set aside even from the rabbis and the scribes of that time. They had a distance that a leper could not come because the leprosy was a very contagious disease. And this individual came to Christ because he knew that Jesus Christ could heal him. And then we go with verse 3. And Jesus put forth his hands and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer a gift that Moses commanded for the testimony unto them. And this gift to the priest is uh, described in Leviticus 14. It's a cleansing process that the leper must go through, and it goes into great detail in Leviticus as to what that would take, and then he needs to remain clean for seven days, and on the eighth day, he would go back to the priest, and at that point in time, the priest would say that he was a clean person, and in fact, clean of leprosy. Verse 5, And when Jesus <clears throat> was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick with the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. This servant was a Gentile, and under Jewish law it was illegal for a Jew to go into the unclean house of a Gentile is the reason for the centurion statement here. And he, the centurion also said that all you have to do is speak. You don't have to come to my house. He had enough faith in Christ to know that he could do the will. Verse 7, And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speaketh the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Verse 9, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus heard it and marveled and said the following, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be case out and under darkness there shall be no there shall be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servants was healed in the safe sound hour. And this is taking the centurion, being a Gentile, uh, told Christ that you wouldn't have to come. I'm a centurion of the Roman army. I know I tell people to go and they go, and I tell people to come and they come. I have the faith. I know that you can do this even without coming into my house. And Christ is setting up a, a uh, picture, if you would, of the uh, kingdom in heaven being again with Abraham and Isaac. And it was believed at the time that only the children of Israel would be allowed into this final supper, this final kingdom. And he's saying that even the Israelites, if they don't have the faith in me, they will not be at the final supper. And then we're going to go all the way to Matthew 9 and 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And in the other Gospels, this ruler is a ruler of the synagogue. He's of the institution that is trying to prevent Christ from teaching Christianity, if you would. Uh, they are set in their ways in the rules of the law. They, this person would have gone to any length, all lengths possible to seek help other than going to Jesus to ask for his daughter. So he had extinguished all other possible hope whenever he even approached Jesus to ask him. Verse 19, And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him, and touched the hem of his garment. And she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. And she is going on superstition here, if you would, in the touching the garment of a rabbi, priest of that nature. She could get a healing at this point she had not asked for, and she would not approach because she was unclean. Okay, 22. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Christ came into the ruler's house, and saw the minstrels and the people making the noise. And again, at this time in the Bible, the, whenever someone had a funeral, they had flute players that would come, and they had people that would come and wail. And the wealthier people would actually hire flute players to come in to play and wailers to wail so as the people came in to see the deceased there would be a great noise and a wailing and crying which would induce the person coming in as well to wail and cry verse 24 he said unto them give peace for the maid is not dead but sleepeth and they laughed him to scorn but when the people were put forth he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the frame therefore went abroad unto all the land. 27. 
And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he came unto the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. And he, then he touched their eyes, saying, According to the faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, and saying, See that no man know it. But they went, and they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all the country. And this gives three examples of how just a little bit of faith, some faith, can do good in Christ. And that's all it takes is a little bit of faith and a little bit of belief. The first example was an inadequate motive in that the ruler of the synagogue, he was not understanding, he was not necessarily appreciating Christ, but he'd heard that Christ could do healings and so forth, and he had tried to all his avail to find help for his daughter and was unable to do so. So he went to his last resort, which was Christ. The second one, uh, the lady, she was inadequate in faith in that she tried to not approach Christ because of her uncleanliness, but she was going to come behind him and touch his, his robe, which would have been something that would have been out of superstition or word of thought of that time. <clears throat> And in the, the ones that called him the son of David, they looked on him as an intern of earthly <clears throat> power. Excuse me. I had a cold last week. You'll have to bear with me here just a little bit. So they came to him more as the son of David than as actually Jesus Christ. So in, in all of these situations, they had not come to the full realization of what Jesus was, what he stood for. <clears throat> but the little bit of faith that they had and showed to Christ, he granted them their healings and wishes. And with that, I'd like to go to Matthew 15 and 21. <clears throat> then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. At this was a place in time when Jesus was going to get uh, away from, if you would, uh, the normal Israelites that they had been in the company of. He was going to teach his disciples of the day of the cross. So they were in a position to where they were trying to get to where he could relate to the disciples and teach the disciples what they needed to know. He knew his time was short. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. 23. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. 26. But he answered and said, It is not meant to take the children's bread and to cast it before dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, 
yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. When Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto the you, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And in this, she was um, a Gentile, not of Israel. And at, up until this time, Christ was sent, not but just to the house of Israel. And with his crucifixion, opened up to all people, Gentiles, Israelites, and all. And this lady had the faith to know that he could and would heal if she would worship him as she did. And again, she approached him with the title of Son of David, and he rejected her with that. And as she worshipped him, she had an understanding of who he actually was. And we'll go to Mark chapter 6. <laughs> And verse 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed. And when the Sabbath day came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, and even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Verse 3, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Verse 5, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid hands upon the few sick folk and healed them. Verse 6, And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the villages teaching. And the example here is that we have a hard time recognizing somebody in his own environment, the area where he grew up, it is hard to appreciate any accomplishments of him. But what we get out of this is that God came to us as a normal worker, normal person. He didn't come in in a high prestigious office but he came in as just an ordinary person and showed what greatness could come from that. And with that, I'd like to go to Mark 10. And we'll start with verse 46. And a little bit of uh, setup for this, if you would. Uh, Jericho is 15 miles from Jerusalem. Uh, it was coming up on the time of the Passover. The priest at the time served in Jerusalem in courses. They were on duty, they were off duty. And with Jericho being as close to Jeru Jerusalem as it was, there would probably have been a lot of the rabbis and scribes 
uh, of the synagogue that would have been in the streets waiting as well to see this person Jesus come through. They'd heard about him and they wanted to see him, see what he had to say, because the, Jesus' teaching would make their temple worship of no need, and they certainly did not want that. Okay, verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Tiamas, sat by the highway, side begging. 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. 48. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. 49. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. 50. And he cast away his garment, rose, and came to Jesus. 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do to thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. And what we see here, we really see someone that has a true worth and gratitude for what Christ, not only did he show faith and worship and ask for a healing, but after the healing, he could have gone his own way, done his own deeds or whatever, but he continued to follow Christ not that he, he had sight at this point in time, so he didn't need to follow him for someone to see, but he went along, I feel, to help. And this is a sign of discipleship that is an example to us. And with that, I would like to go to 1 Corinthians 15. start with verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and within ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of, of a, above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Eight, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Nine, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am that I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they. Yea, not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. <coughs> Eleven. Therefore, 
there, whether for it were I or they, as we preach, and so ye believe. Now, if Christ was preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? And what Paul's getting to at this point is there were certain among the Corinthians that believed not in an afterlife. Even with Christ, they understood that he rose. There had been too many examples of people that actually saw this at this time that were still alive that could be talked to. But they continued to believe that there was no afterlife, and that's where this is all headed. Uh, 11, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. 12, now if Christ is preached, that he rose from the dead. I've already read that, sorry. Let's go to 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. In other words, if Christ had not rose, what is there to Christianity? It's all vanity, because that's what Christianity is all about, is the afterlife and the saving grace of Christ. 15, yea, and we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God and he raised up Christ and he raised not up. If so, be that the dead not rise. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? 17, and if Christ be not raised, then faith is vain, ye have yet you are yet in your sins. 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Twenty-one, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Twenty-two, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And he's saying here that in through Christ all men shall live. With Adam came death, and yes, we had the law, and the law was hard for the human flesh body to obey and have, and I feel that's why he sent Christ to us to give us uh, redemption. Verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward that they are Christ at his coming. 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father. Then he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, and death is Satan. 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also above him be subject unto him, and put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are then they baptized for the dead? 30. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? 31. I protest 
by your rejoicing, which I have in Jesus Christ, our Lord, I die daily. 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantages it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And what Paul's saying here is that he has put his life on the line. He's been in prison. And what is advantage is it to him if there is not an afterlife or a resurrection? And his last comment in the last verse is, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, let's just, let's not worry about Christianity, let's not worry about anything. Let's just make the best for what we have right now. Verse 33, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. 34, Awake to righteousness, and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now we're getting ready to go into things that are a matter of faith and not fact. It's not something that he could show them. It's not something that there was an example that he could say this is how it is. So we're starting with verse 35. It's going to be matters of faith that you're going to have to understand. But some, will, some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And what, what body did they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Verse 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest, but that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat, or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body, as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fishes, and another of birds. 40. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made the quickening spirit. 46. How be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 48. As, the, as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also hear the image of the heavenly. And what he's telling us here is we're in the flesh body, it's corrupt, it will die, it will pass on to a spiritual body, which is not corrupt, it's incorrupt. And again, he gets back to the first man, Adam, which has a quickening spirit and has brought forth from the dust to flesh in a corruptible body that will go away. And through Christ, he has brought us a quickening spirit that is incorruptible 
and it will last forever. It's not, it will not deteriorate, it will not fall apart. It's something that will be with us forever. And we'll go to Colossians. Colossians 4 and 12, and we're just going to be very short here. Ephesus, who is one of you, the servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them that are in Hepalopolis. 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. And they make notice of Demas here, and he was mentioned three times in Scripture. The first time, uh, this, I guess this is a story about his disbelief uh, in references to Demas. In Philemon 24, uh, he's listed as Paul's fellow laborer. Here, he's simply listed as Demas. And in the last, Place that he's mentioned in Scripture, 2 Timothy 4.10. He was forsaken Paul because he loved his present world, which is an example of a failure in faith. So he started out, he had faith, he was a worker, and then he fell by the wayside. The worldly things became more important to him than the spiritual things. Uh, what will happen to him, and we'll leave that up to the Father to judge. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to 1 Thessalonians, which is right there. And we'll start with chapter 1. Paul and Silvius and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We gave thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Verse 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, the patience of hope in your Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our angel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance, as ye know the manner of men, we were among you for your sake. Verse 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how we turned to God from idols to serve the living true God and to wait for his Son from heaven when he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And with that, 
Paul is showing them that they had the faith and they had the works to go out and teach and preach, get the people away from idols uh, in this first chapter of Thessalonians, and he's basically building them up, and I'm not going to go on in Thessalonians, but he's building them up to let them, uh, it's hard to go up to somebody and just say, hey, you're doing this wrong or that wrong. It's easier to butter them up a little bit and say, here's what you've done good, and then go ahead and continue from that. And then I would like to go to Hebrews 11. We'll start with verse 1, Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things good hoped for and evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Four, with faith, Abel offered, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. And Abel had not only faith, but he had works. He had to do the tending of the soil to make his offering to God, so he had faith as well as works. Five, by faith Enoch was translated, and that he should not see death and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he had pleased God. Six, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by that which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Can we imagine if Noah had had all the faith in the world but had done no work? It takes work to get beyond salvation, to get beyond the milk of the Scripture. It takes works to be pleasing to God and to accomplish things. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And we could go on the whole chapter 11 in Hebrews is all about faith and what people did with their faith and works. And if you want to continue or read on that some other time or whatever, that's basically what that's all about, is showing that through any of our prophets past, any of the great people in the Bible, they not only had faith, they had works. They had, the work is what makes you something to God other than just 
somebody that is looking for salvation, is salvation okay? Hey, it's fine for some. The choice is yours. The decision is yours to make. And then to conclude, I want to go to James chapter 2, 14. Verse 14, chapter 2. What doth it profit, my brethren, that a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye gave them not those things which are needed, to the body, what doth it profit? 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith but my works. 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. 20. But wilt thou, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had authored Isaac, his son, unto the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought <clears throat> with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believeth God, and it is imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. 24, Ye see then how that by the works a man is justified, and not by faith only. 25, likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had not sent them out another way? 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And I... My attempt was to show, I hope that I did, that uh, faith only is good enough for some. It'll get you salvation. You just have to believe on Christ as the scripture tells us. But if you want to be acknowledged by God or do more for God, your works are what carry you on beyond salvation. I won't say faith because faith is part of works, and works are of faith. And I guess with that, I'll conclude. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. What is the Bible? You know, if it isn't in the Bible, cull it, trash it. Okay, you get a bunch of hypochondriacs in a circle and start um, using hype. 
and they'll come alive, but give me some real sick people, and let's let God do the healing, all right? But let's do it the way God says. How did he say do it? He didn't say holler fire. He didn't knock them down. He picks us up. Uh, he said to anoint them, much as he did David, anoint them with the oil of our people. If they're not anointed with the oil of the people, do you think God's going to heal them? Because that's the instruction. James chapter 5. The oil does not heal, but it is your obedience in obeying God that brings about the healing. That when you see that, you have seen one that practices and follows the only healer uh, spiritually, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Fire. <laughs> now that is funny. That is really funny. Okay, uh, Sharon from uh, Texas. I guess you can tell I never watch any of that stuff. There's a circus comes through here once in a while, and I do go to it sometimes. Sharon from Texas. I was listening to another pastor and he said America or a superpower are not around in the book of Revelations. Can you comment on this? Well, what does he call the one world system? That's a superpower, but it's a superpower in the negative rather than the positive. Where does he think America is going to go? All Christian nations are superpowers or are doing very well at this time and always have. Do you mean to say that again? Well, are you prejudiced? No, I'm, I'm very wise. It, you know, it doesn't take a wise person long to look around which countries are being blessed, those basically that are Christian. That's just the way it is. You know, uh, how, uh, let's take uh, Russia. Russia, of course, it was predicted long ago in Genesis 27 that they would live away from the fat of the land. Esau has and always will. And um, they don't do quite as well. And they take on communism that tries to drive God out of even the whole country, and you would expect them to be blessed. They're not, okay? And um, so, so forth. It's just that simple. I cannot imagine a minister that would make a statement like that. That's awesome. Ray from Canada. Will sheep and lambs recognize Satan when he is here on earth? That's a, that's a neat question, you know. I, I think that perhaps, uh, Ray, you're wanting me to say that if a person claims to be a Christian and follows the true Christ, they will know his voice because the sheep do recognize their shepherd. Well, it's true. And God's elect will not follow the fake shepherd because we know his voice. We know he's coming first. We know he's going to be yelling, I've come to fly you out of here. We ain't going. Yeah, the real sheep and lambs recognize the voice of the true Christ. Why? He's the living word, and he has warned us that the fake is coming first and how he speaks, and even down as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what he'll be saying, okay? Uh, good question. Joyce from Wisconsin. I was wondering if I might get to see my husband in heaven when I die. He died April the 6th, and I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, all Christians go to meet the Father, and uh, that's what we work forward to. Bless you. Can he see what I am doing now? Will we know each other? And it is obvious that you will from the millennium uh, chapters of Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 25, that even... Um, family are able to help blood or married family. But does he know what you're doing now? He's probably, you know, he's he's got real good things to look for and enjoy. And uh, I'm sure that he pulls for you and so forth. Marty from Kansas. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 44 through 47, I cannot find a cross-reference to pre-existence of a spiritual body. My husband thinks I heard you wrong. I think I heard you right. Please clarify this. Thank you for planting the seeds of biblical truth. Well, you are so welcome. 
You know, I'm going to surprise a lot of people. I do not believe in the word pre-exist because no soul has ever stopped existing, not even Satan's, from the day way in the first earth age when God created us. We did pre-exist in the first earth age, but our souls have never stopped existing. Not even Satan has died. I want to, I want to say that, and now I'm going to tell you where you can find that we did exist in the first earth age. Why would God say to, um, in the ninth chapter of Romans, while they were still in their womb, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, because all souls come from God. They were with him. We were with him. And he knows us before you ever enter the womb. And exactly as he said, well, does that mean they pre-existed? Whatever you want to call it. I would prefer existed with God. Uh, another documentation is um, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. When the silver cord parts, when you die, the flesh, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, instantly goes back to the Father that gave it. Do you know what goes back mean? means it came from there, okay? Everything comes down, everything's got to go back. It is written. I was going to real quickly give you that phone number again, and I'm going to run out of time, but I'm going to do it anyway. 215 822-9093, and I'm out of time. Hey, I love y'all a bunch. Do you know why? And, and hey, you chose on few boys stay warm, okay? I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. And most important, you know, God loves you for it. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, but there's one thing that's even more important. That's this. That you stay in his word. Hey, every day in his word's a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, Call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.